Do you see people around you in influencer marketing thinking outside the box? What do you see around you in terms of the influencer space? The most hot topic with brands, clients, agencies is brand safety. We've seen what can happen when a brand takes a risk and they do something and it explodes. And we've seen it explode for the better and we've seen it explode for the worse. Brand safety is a, the number one concern in influencer marketing. And I think that that prevents some thinking out outside the box and taking risks because a risk could be absolutely disastrous. So I would love to say, yes, so many brands are taking a risk and they're doing really innovative things and they're thinking about at least this practice in different ways. But right now, I've seen a lot of brands kind of go back to the basic. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the WIM podcast. Women in Influencer Marketing is a first-of-its-kind exclusive networking group made up of inspirational women. This podcast is where we explore influencer marketing and get real about women in business. Find us wherever you download podcasts, and of course, you can always find us at IamWim.com. That's IamWim, double I, dot com. Hey guys, what is going on? I always feel like I never have my microphone set up properly and I'm always like, oh shit, we're recording. Let me move it. Anyways, guys, welcome to the pod. If you are new here, giant warm, warm welcome. I'm really happy to have all of you here today. Today's episode is an interview episode and it is particularly good. I was literally tearing up towards the end. Yeah, we talk about everything. I mean, from influencer marketing strategy, that was not bringing me to tears. <laughs> we were talking about what it is to be a professor in influencer marketing. That was fun. Going out from agency life to doing your own thing and your own consultancy to what it is to be a working mom and having gone through the process of infertility. And so trigger warning, towards the end of the episode, we do talk about pregnancy loss. Um, we do talk about IVF and successful pregnancies, but we get into all things mom talk. So Jenny Heinrich is our guest today, and I'm really excited for you to hear from her. So she is a global strategic storyteller at this point of recording. She's got over 23 years of experience helping brands find the perfect balance across paid, earned, and owned channels, plus tactics to effectively and efficiently intersect and engage with the audiences that they're trying to reach. She's held leadership positions at Weber Shanwick, MSL Group, Edelman, and Finn Partners. And most recently, Jenny was the EVP, Head of Influencers, Entertainment, Talent, and Music at Ketchum. She's also an influencer marketing professor at DePaul University in Chicago, where she teaches students in a first-of-its-kind course that she designed helping develop the next generation of influencer marketers. I think it's so dope that she's a professor. I low-key like probably wish I asked her more questions about that, but we did get into it a bit. I'm so curious about it. I'm hearing more and more women who are like becoming professors at universities. What an interesting path to go down. And she's an adjunct professor, so she's doing it in real life professionally. And then she's going in and having students who probably eat up every single thing that she says, because I was eating up everything that she was saying during our conversation. So speaking of Chicago, which is where Jenny is based, she will be at our event. And so will so many others of you. So fun fact, we actually had one of our first in-person events was in Chicago. I want to say it was 2018. So we're going back a bit of time and Chicagoans, if that's how you say it, y'all turn up, like show up. You guys were incredible. The enthusiasm and the number of people that were there, it was like really magnetic. So when we have been leaning so heavily into in-person events and experiences this year for WIM in 2023, 
I was like, all right, where do we go? So we've been on a tour, you guys. We have been to Vegas, New York, LA. Well, we just went back to LA. That was amazing for the second time this year. We are doing New York again on July 27th. You have to come. And then we are also coming to Chicago. Don't forget, buy your ticket on September 14th. It's going to be beautiful weather. I'm so excited. I love Chicago. I'm like booking my hotel and airfare probably this week. And I'm just super excited to come and to meet with all of our Chicago community. So you're not going to want to miss out. I promise, promise, promise. We're going to have panel discussion, activities, giveaways, gift bags, dinner, drinks. Like it's going to be incredible. Check out our website. Of course, I am whim.com slash events to get your ticket. And keep in mind too that members with all of our in-person events get half off on their tickets. So if you've been like, "Mm, should I become a member of WIM? Like, am I that enthused about influencer marketing? And if the answer is yes, and you've been debating it for a while, and you're in Chicago or you're traveling through, or you're in New York and you're traveling through, we've got these events that are incredible and now might be the time to join. So check out again, I am whim.com slash events. And it's I A M W I I M dot com slash events. Okay, you guys, I'm so excited for you to enjoy this episode with Jenny Rick. Welcome to the pod. It's really nice to have you here. How's it going today? You know what? The sun is shining. It's been so, so summer weather over here in Chicago. So today's a great day. Thanks for having me. Your hair looks fabulous. I was going to say, I hope everyone's watching the video version because your hair looks amazing. Well, thank you. I've been called, you know, the Carrie Bradshaw lookalike. I'm a tiny little human. I've got this giant big hair. I love the humidity. So thank you. I hope that it's showing up well for my podcast appearance today. It is. It definitely is. And I've been like looking forward to our chat today. We've been like, I don't know, we've gotten to know each other the littlest bit just like online. And it's really nice to sort of put a face to an online presence and just sort of get to know you today. And Um, I'm excited for our audience to get to know you too. So we heard a little bit about you on paper in the intro to the show, but I personally love to hear it from the person directly. And I also want to like take it back, like further from, you know, what's on paper beyond that. I want to hear a little bit about Jenny as a kid and like, How do you think it shaped you as the professional that you've become today? Well, Jenny as a kid is very similar to Jenny as a grown-up, or a grown-up as I call myself now. Um, I've always been a storyteller. I come from a really long line of storytellers. You know, I like talking. I like finding out, you know, what makes other people tick, and I like connecting with people. So I think, you know, that's directly representative of what I've done professionally because influence is all about storytelling. It's about content and it's about connection. So that's kind of the first thing that I thought about. You know, I was always the one to ask a lot of questions, to sit and think about it, and then add my own two cents on top of that. So that, you know, is the first thing that I think of when I think of me as a kid. Are you an only child? I'm not. I have a younger sister who is quiet. She was a little quieter when we were growing up, which gave me, you know, center stage. Um, I love being on a stage. You know, I'm very outgoing. I can walk up to anyone, strike a conversation. I'm not shy. Shocking, I know. So I love doing that. I love being on the stage even now. You know, whenever I get an opportunity to chat and to connect with other people, I jump at it. The other part of of me as a kid, which is translated really well to me as a grown-up, is the strategist brain. I've always been a strategist. You know, my parents will tell you that I was always looking for a way around 
you know, the things that they wanted me to do. I would always, you know, kind of be a little bit argumentative, like, okay, well, this is what you want to happen. But have you ever thought of this plan? When I do that now with, you know, my clients, with Brands Direct, with my team, you know, the different agencies I've worked at, I really, you know, I listen. I kind of evaluate what people are trying to do. And then my strategist brain kicks in and I try to figure out the best ways through it. So that's, you know, some of the ways that I've really translated me as a kid into me as a grown up. Do you also think like strategy, does that also equate to you as like thinking outside the box? I guess it doesn't necessarily, but does that resonate with you personally? Absolutely. I mean, there's so many, I call it the sea of same, you know, where a lot of people, they go into, you know, their career, they go into their personal and they just kind of want to go with the flow. I was an absolute wild child, really late too, you know, into my mid to late 20, probably longer than I should have been a wild child. I was definitely thinking outside the box, doing things that probably I shouldn't be, that I would never let my children do, P.S. Um, but, I, you know, I like breaking the mold. I like forging my own path. And, you know, all the team members, my students that I've mentored, I always encourage that too. Like, don't just go with the grain. You know, the most amazing things can happen when you break outside of that and you kind of forge your own path. So I absolutely did that when I was a kid and I've been doing it ever since. So real talk, do you see people around you in influencer marketing thinking outside the box? Do you think that they're thinking outside the box enough? What do you see around you in terms of the influencer space? Well, I mean, it ebbs and flows, right? So I think right now, the most kind of hot topic with brands, clients, agencies is brand safety. You know, and We've seen what can happen when a brand, you know, takes a risk and they do something and it explodes, right? And we've seen it explode for the better and we've seen it explode for the worse. So I think right now, brand safety is a, the number one concern in influencer marketing. And I think that that prevents some thinking outside the box and taking risks because a risk could be absolutely disastrous. So... I would love to say yes, you know, so many brands are taking a risk and they're doing really innovative things and they're thinking about this, at least this practice in different ways. But right now, I've seen a lot of brands kind of go back to the basics, you know, vetting. I've never done vetting how I'm doing it now and how I'm counseling my students, my team members and my clients and brands on how to vet because you need to do your diligence, you know, and so Yes, think outside the box. Yes, do something innovative, but also, you know, make sure that you're holding true to what you need to and that you're kind of really, really researching before you jump into anything. So that's what I'm kind of saying. And I just feel like that uses two different, completely opposite and sides of your brain, you know, so much so that like some people aren't even capable of doing both. And so I agree with you. I'm sort of wanting to not lead the answer, but <laughs> like, that's definitely what I've seen as well. I wish more people thought outside the box a bit more, but I wonder if the box is too well-defined and too restrictive for them to be able to do it. Like in order to be creative, I don't know, I'll just be personally, like, I have to have the space to be able to do that or else it's like literally not even possible for me. Do you feel like there's a world in which you know, you can be that regimented that, you know, do all that due diligence, do all that research and everything, but also have the space like to truly think outside the box. And like, if so, how is that possible? How does it happen? So, uh, you know, the way that I approach it is that you're always going to have your do's and don'ts. You're always going to have your brand like mandatory things that you're going to have to say and have to include. FTC, LDA, you know, there's all the governing bodies that control what we do. But then on the other side, you know, the agencies that are counseling their brands to do this well, they're leading with creator first approach, right? They're leading with co-creation. The minute that you over direct an influencer, you know, and say, you know, this is what you have to do and this is how you have to say it. And this is, you know, the way that we want the content to look. It's exactly what you were saying. You know, it kind of stops creativity right in its tracks, you know, but co-creation, think about it, right? You found an influencer because you wanted to access their audience. You found them because you love the way they create content. 
You love the way they tell stories. You love their look and their tone and their aesthetic. You love how they connect, you know, with their various communities across the different platforms they're on. So having said all that, don't stop them from being them, right? Don't put all these parameters in place that limits the creativity. That's why, yes, you have your mandatories and yes, you have your guardrails, but give them all the information that you need to give them and then let them riff. And that's where kind of the magic happens, right? It's in that riff where, you know, you go back and forth and you're like, okay, here, oh, that's a great idea. What if we incorporate it here? That breeds creativity. And that also, you know, makes sure that you're getting the impact out of any content that's created because the second that you have too much control, that the creative is gone, you know, it becomes an ad. You're almost casting the influencer in this piece of content instead of really letting their voice and their tone and, you know, the way they want to tell that story come to be. So I think there's a world where you can seriously do both. I just think that you have to find that balance, you know, and that's where I've seen the best content come to life across social. And so let's talk about impact and like the best content you've seen. Like, Who's done something that's really impressed you lately? Like give them their flowers. It could be a brand, a company, an influencer, marketer, an influencer. Like who has really stood out to you these days? So one brand that I've been watching, and I can't wait to see how they're going to bring this to life, is Land Rover. So Land Rover, automotive, you know, out of any category out there, they've got their enthusiasts, right? Like the BMW drivers, the Land Rover drivers, you know, any of them. They buy, you know, car after car after car. Once you get in to that, you know, brand, oftentimes you stay there unless there's like a really valid reason why you want to leave. Land Rover is doing something extremely interesting right now. They realize that their badge, Land Rover, holds no weight. Instead, their enthusiasts, their community, their, you know, people that drive their cars, they never say, oh, I drive a Land Rover. You say, oh, I drive a Range Rover or I just drive a Defender or a Discovery or whatever it might be. So they're actually dropping Land Rover. So you won't see the Land Rover emblem on any of their cars moving forward. You're just going to see Range Rover. And that to me is a really modern take on community and enthusiasts. You know, a brand actually dropping their brand name and instead going with the model because that's what they see from the people who drive their cars. I think that's brilliant, you know, and when I saw it, I was like, well, that makes all the sense in the world. I'm surprised it took you until 2023 to think of that because it's true, right? So that's one brand I see doing amazing things. Another in the automotive space is BMW. I've been watching BMW forever and ever and ever. They have mastered the art of storytelling. Whenever they're launching a new car, they have the best tease campaign. They show just enough. It's always covered with a cloth and they show just enough to get their enthusiasts excited. And then they roll through their programming. They unveil it. They invite, you know, a select group of VIPs to experience the car and to get in it because they know they're going to spread word of mouth, which is the essence of influence. I love BMW for what they do and for the stories they tell. I think their brand is strong. The people that drive their cars are very unique type. And they appeal, you know, to a lot of different audiences with the way they tell stories. So those are kind of two examples, same category, but I'm going to stay there for today. I love what they do. So those are two, you know, modern brands that are really looking at, you know, community and the way that people talk about them and the way they engage and connect with their brand and they're innovating as a result. Obsessed with BMW as well. I was actually at CES this year and like most CESs, like a lot of car companies will, you know, like show their latest tech. But we went, we had just gotten a BMW like right before we went and we're like, they're going to have this whole like presentation. Let's go check it out. It was so good. I mean, first of all, the tech that they were showing was just like, it was a color changing car. It was like the coolest thing ever. So like, but like Arnold Schwarzenegger was part of it. And like, it was a whole presentation. It was like the storytelling part, a hundred percent. And they had their CEO there and um, 
yeah, I mean, I can personally relate to that, like just wanting to be part of that community. And the Range Rover thing, that's so funny that you mentioned that. Literally the other day, we're walking through our neighborhood and we saw this nice looking car parked in some neighbor's driveway. And my boyfriend, Paul, was like, oh, it looks like a Range Rover. And he's like, oh, no, it's a Defender because that's all that was on the car. And like, it makes you like think about it a little bit more too, because it's thinking outside the box. It's something that you don't see every day where you're so used to seeing, you know, BMW or Toyota or like whatever it is on the car. And you're like, Defender, like, do I know that? What is that? And maybe it makes you research it a little more and be like, oh, it's like something outside the box. I think it's really cool. And think about it this way too, you know, like the heart of what we do with audience. I am a data first, science to art right? Always. And what Land Rover is doing is they're actually zoning right into the audience. They know that the Range Rover driver, you know, the giant Range Rover versus the Sport versus the Evoke versus, you know, they are all different drivers. You know, same with the Defender, the Discovery. So what they're doing is they're tapping in. They're going really, really direct into those different audiences so that they can kind of target their communication, their content, their engagement directly to you instead of having that umbrella of the Land Rover drivers. I think it's so, so smart and really modern, like I said before. It is. And what it sort of like jogs in my mind is just going a little bit more niche, right? Sort of what you're saying, like it's not just like these broad strokes, this umbrella brand, like it's focusing on your niche audiences, which of course can be relatable in the influencer world. I'm curious, like, when you work with brands and you've worked with so many throughout your career, like when is a niche strategy the best strategy or like how do you figure out whether it is the right strategy for the brand? It's a great question. You know, and I've been thinking a lot about niche audiences lately. I totally understand brands that want to dive in to a specific group, you know, and really drive impact there. My caution to brands when they do that is don't make it a one-off. You know, if you want to intersect with a niche audience, make sure that you're doing it consistently, you're doing it authentically, and you're doing it over a way longer period of time than that one-off. Because if you go in and you try to connect with a niche group and you're doing it as a one-off and you've never done it before, it won't make any sense. And we've seen what happens, right, when, you know, different brands do that. It makes complete sense in the world that you'd want to, you know, be appealing and, you know, have that connection to a niche audience that, you know, you're trying to attract. You know, influencers are great for that, right? A lot of the different brands, you know, the strategy is, oh, I really want to intersect with this audience. How am I going to do that in a really meaningful way? Oh, partner with a creator that has that audience. And then they can be that storyteller that connects you. But doing it as a one-off and doing it in a really non-consistent way, that's not authentic, right? People see through that in a second. They're like, oh, that's marketing, you know? And I think that's the trick is that if you want to start developing that relationship with a niche group, you need to do it, you know, with a long tail. Do it with authenticity. Make sure that it aligns with the values of your brand. And you have to make sure the way you're doing it aligns with your broader audience. Because the minute that you alienate your most salient, your biggest audience, your advocates and enthusiasts, in order to attract that niche group, you're going to lose that, you know, connection and that rapport with your largest audience. And they might come back and say, hey, that's not okay with me. You know, we're here. We've been buying your products. We've been talking about you for X amount of years. And now I feel like you left me alone. So I think the best way to, you know, intersect with niche groups is to have it, you know, be a strategy and how do it trickle. So till you build that affinity and you build that trust and then you continue it so that it doesn't feel like a one off that you're doing it, you know, in a specific season, because that's what everyone else is doing. And it's like, no, that's not the way this works. Mm, That's so interesting. I've never really heard anyone's take on that. What you just said, which is, you know, you don't want to forget about your most loyal people and like they feel abandoned or they feel like not as appreciated and they're they've been your most loyal fans and 
for however long they have been. But yeah, I think that like a lot of businesses, you know, you want to keep growing. There's such pressure to just continuously grow and capture new audience members and follow trends, perhaps, which is, I think, what you were alluding to. And um, I think that that's valid. And maybe the way for it not to feel so performative is like you were saying, just like incorporate it fully into your strategy. Like don't make it a one-off thing. And also, you know, retain the focus of your firstborn. (laughs) You know, don't forget about them. They've been there since the beginning. What, how else do you think that brands can, you know, be better at influencer marketing? Are there certain traps that you see people fall into or like, what would you like to see to have like brands improve and do better? Well, we talked about it a little bit before, right? Co-creation. Everything should be co-creation when you're working with an influencer for all the reasons I said before, you know, the minute that you kind of overstep and over direct, it impacts the content. And the community, right? The followers, wherever they are, they can see it a mile away. You know, I always tell my students when I'm talking to them, I'm like, look through a feed of an influencer, any influencer, and you'll immediately be able to see the piece of content where the brand had too much input because it doesn't look, it doesn't sound, it doesn't feel like that influencer anymore. And that content doesn't perform as well. Or the worst is when you see a bunch of the, these influencers that you follow and all do the same post for the same brand and they all like sound the same. It's like so cringy. It's so cringy when you see that. It is. It's like canned, right? It's like, oh, I can read the brief. I knew exactly what the brief was that this influencer got delivered because they're delivering it exactly, you know, uniform across social. So that's one thing I caution, you know, always create. I think another thing that brands really need to look at is, again, the one-offs or campaign-focused activations. The brands that I feel like are doing the best really, truly have an always-on approach to their creator storytelling. You know, owned content, you know, the content that brands are creating themselves and posting across social will only get you so far, right? But that third party storytelling where you can have, you know, it integrate and do your own channels that you have other people telling the story of your brand or your product or whatever it is you're doing, lean on that. Don't do it, you know, only during back to school or only during the holidays, you know, or only during, you know, the big game, you know, because that's when you think your product or, you know, you really need to lean on influencers to start telling your story. Have them throughout storytelling, social content. That's always on. That doesn't stop. It's not seasonal. It happens all the time. And so should your approach. So that's something that I would really caution at. You know, go in. Yes, you can have your murky influencers that maybe plus up during really, really important moments during your season, but always have, you know, your micro influencer level who are continuously telling stories. And some of that content, this is what I tell brands, you're going to get so much value add because what it does when you have more of an always-on approach is that, yes, you're going to contract them for X number of posts, but they're still going to use your products in between. And every single time you're building affinity, you're building that trust, the authenticity is way stronger because you see, yes, you know, here's the branded post, but here's a bunch of time that this influencer still use this brand throughout the year, that's what this is all about. It's about driving that trust and that authenticity. So my one caution to brands and my one, you know, I'll advocate it till I go to sleep at night is treat it like an always on channel. Influencers are there. There are people that love your brands. Go find them, bring them in and get them talking about you continuously. Not only when you really, really need to kind of plus up, but have them talking about you all the time. You know, those are some of the things that I've been telling brands, especially over the past few years since the pandemic, where digital usage, social media attention skyrocketed, the number of creators skyrocketed. Treat your content like that. We've had a lot of conversations recently in the community about You know, the challenges of somebody further along in their career are very different from the challenges that, you know, happened when you were like one or two years into influencer. And not enough people are talking about what it is to be, you know, like 
a senior level, you know, person at your company. And you've held like these really great titles and been at like really well-known companies. And I'm curious, what are some of the like struggles that you've experienced, you know, further along in your career that you think maybe not enough of us are talking about? Sure. It's a really good question. You know, I've worked at a lot of PR firms over the past dozen plus years, you know, Weber Shanwick, MSL Group, Edelman, Bim Partners, Ketchum, and some midsize and smaller agencies as well. One thing I've noticed is that the specialist capability, you can't treat that specialty like you do a PR client. You know, it doesn't fit into the mold. Especially in our industry, there are so many influencer-specific agencies, technologies with managed service, other companies that are very specifically doing influencer work. So when you take that influencer practice and try to fit it in to, you know, a very traditional agency model, it becomes inefficient. Your working versus non-working dollars becomes too balanced. And that's not the way that our business works. You know, our working dollars need to be, you know, versus our non-working dollars, our fee needs to be lower because we have so much out of pocket because that's the essence of our business, right? We're partnering with people. They need compensation. So that's one thing that I've really noticed, you know, that pretty consistent across big agency is that you need to treat this specialty differently. Otherwise, you're going to be non-competitive because you can go to an influencer specific agency that are way more efficient, that know exactly, you know, what clients want and how to deliver it in a competitive way across the landscape. And the minute that you're not working and non-working start to become balanced, which is very typical for PR clients, that's where you're going to lose the game. And that's really kind of the most salient thing that I've seen, you know, at big agencies, which was one of the reasons, you know, I chose to kind of go off on my own and be a consultant because I know the way this work needs to run. I want to give, you know, my clients the most value, right? And in order to do that, you got to cut out a lot of the agency stuff, a lot of the admin, a lot of the meetings. You know, when you sit in meetings from 8.30 to 5.30 every day and the work happens in the evening and that's what happens when you become really senior, that's not sustainable, you know? So that's what I see from agencies. You know, I built practices from zero up to be, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars, a team of one to a team of 35 within a year and a half. You know, I've done those things. However, you need to apply a different business model to your specialties, to that capability so that you can, you know, capture the marketplace and you won't just get thrown to the side in favor of another agency that's doing specifically this and who can provide that value in a different way. All right. So I have to tell you guys a little bit about a company that I absolutely love. It's called Oversubscribe. Their co-founder, Peter, was actually recently on this podcast. So go check out that episode from June 20th. But basically, Oversubscribe is a place where fans can fund their favorite creators and earn back on that investment. So if you're a creator or their management, you should totally check them out. The million dollar question these days is always around growth, how to grow, how to scale, And if you're a creator who wants to expand your business, but you simply don't have the capital to do it, let your fans fund it, the people who are already invested in you. Once the creator successfully grows their business from this investment and earns more based on that funding, the investor, the fans, earn from it too. There are lots of fans out there who would love to invest in their favorite creators, but they simply didn't know that they could. So subscribers now have a real stake in the success in a creator's business, thanks to oversubscribe. They can help them grow financially, which will then in turn make the content better, the quality of the content better, which will accelerate your growth as a creator just because you got some funding from the people who have already supported you for years. I think it's a really innovative idea. I love it. I want you guys to check out oversubscribe.co and just mention when that's oversubscribe.co and tell them Jesse from Wynn sent you. Hey you, thanks for listening to this episode. 
This show is sponsored by Women in Influencer Marketing, the best online community for the creator economy. You'll meet fellow influencer marketers, brands, and talent managers to talk shop, get hired, and even find a mentor. When you join, don't forget to check out all of our incredible resources. We also have dozens of masterclasses from the top voices at TikTok, YouTube, award-winning agencies, and women who are paving the way for us all. If you want a chance to network with a who's who in influencer marketing, just check out what it takes to join the membership collective. Visit IamWim.com slash join today. That's I-A-M-W-I-I-M dot com slash join. And I'll see you around the community. So are you excited that you're now doing your own thing? Like, are you nervous? Like, how do you feel about, you know, having worked for some of these huge companies with resources and, you know, lots of things that are just going to naturally come to you working at an agency. And now you're going off on your own. Do you feel like all of that has prepared you for where you are now? Do you feel like it was sort of the ultimate plan? Or do you feel like, you know, this was just a decision more in the moment and you're seeing if it's the right fit for you? Yeah. I mean, those are all great questions. I you know, I've been working in influencer marketing for over 23 years and I teach it, you know, at the university level. I probably know this more than, you know, being a mom and being parents are like, I know this like the back of my hand. You know, I feel really, really well prepared. And it was kind of exactly what I said. I want to provide that value. I want to provide, you know, big agency, big level thinking, but I want to do it in a really, you know, more kind of agile and nimble way for different clients. And I tell my teams, I tell my students, there's three things that you need in order to be successful. You need recognition, oftentimes, you need reward, and you need resources. You know, for this practice, the best resource you can have is the most amazing tech, right? So as long as you have the most amazing tech, you can use it for discovery, you can use it for campaign management, you can kind of manage your business and your workflow in a really seamless way, you're ahead of the races. Being on your own, you know, there's less layers. You know, like I've worked at giant big agencies with a whole executive leadership team where oftentimes the reward and the recognition gets a little kind of shadowed. So, you know, being on my own, if I do something amazing, I'm going to get that recognition. If I do something terrible, I'm also going to get that recognition. But it's mine to create and it's mine to lose. And then reward, you know, I think reward is not just financial. It's not just compensation. It's not any of that. I get reward from staying happy clients. I get reward from having amazing relationships with creators, um, ones that have lasted for years and years and years because I'm wicked old and I've been doing this for that long. So I've seen them from like follower number five up to millions and millions of followers across channels. When you become really senior in agency land, you know, as the executive vice president, the managing director of all these, you get farther away from the work. And it's the work that I love. I love negotiating. I love doing influencer discovery. I love looking at the content and like, you know, going back and forth with influencers. But as an executive vice president and the managing director of a huge global practice, I have a team of people who really focused on those things. And that's kind of been my world for the past however long. So the beauty of my consultancy is I get to do those things that I love again. You know, I get to become, you know, a senior account executive again. You know, doing the work that I love, that I'm really, really good at, but because I'm so old and I've been doing it for so long, I can do it fast and I can do it with precision. So I'm giving the value to my clients with like the expert thought, the quickness, the efficiency. But I also, for me, I get to go back to the basics of what got me into this industry in the first place. And it makes me so excited. So for someone who is tuning into this conversation and they have like the entrepreneurial itch, you know, they're like, what Jenny's saying sounds good. (laughs) Like, I would love, you know, fill in the blank, whether it's that freedom or that ability to be nimble or to just feel the winds even more because they're yours to feel if it's your company, but they're on the fence or they're nervous or, you know, they're just not sure if it's the right timing what advice would you give them to determine whether it's the right moment to start their own thing? 
is there ever really the right moment? You know, I remember when I was having babies, like, well, I don't want to get pregnant now because X, Y, and Z. There's never a right moment. You just kind of have to jump in, really. You have to take a look at where you're at and what your pie looks like. What is the pie of work, the pie of family, the pie of friend, the pie of my interest? How is it all balancing? If you want to reshift that balance, this might be the right time to go on your own because you'll have more control of all of it. You know, there's been times in my world where work has been the biggest pie and all the other things started getting slivers. And that's just not a way that I wanted to live, right? I have three kids. They're all under 11. So, you know, I'm a little mom life to the max over here. And I'm a professor and I'm a professional and sometimes a wife, no, always a wife. But, you know, that's the one thing that ebbs and flows and how good I'm being as a partner. But those are the things that I wanted to fill my life with. So, you know, in, in a different balance, in a different way. So this was the right time for me to go on my own. The way to do it and the way to do it right, and I've had lots of conversations about this, the number one thing you need when you go on your own is one anchor account. And I call an anchor account one piece of business, one client that's not short term, that's maybe six months long, that is X percent of your hours that you just know you have. That will keep you interested. It'll keep you motivated. It will help with the financial panic where it's like, oh, my God, I got to go find my next you know, gig because I have bills to pay and I got three kids and I have camp coming up and all the rest of the thing. If you have that anchor account, the minute you go solo, it will take a lot of that pressure off and a lot of that stress. And then if you've got that one anchor account, you then get to pick your projects that fill the rest of your hours, right? And those could be passion projects. Those could be more seasonal and campaign based. But as long as you have that anchor, you'll be fine. You'll feel that security that you once had at your full-time job, but you'll also have more bandwidth within your week. So then you can go fill it up with different things. That's my counsel to anyone that wants to break out on their own. Go get your anchor and then redesign your pie, you know, so that it fits with what you want to do and how you want to live your world. And do you see from your purview more and more people going off on their own? Like, were you inspired by other people to do that? Or like, do you feel like people are more nervous to do it and aren't quite pulling the trigger? Yeah, well, you know, going into recession, like this is the thing, like, is there a right time? This was not the right time, you know, on paper, right? We're going into a recession. There were massive layoffs across every industry you've seen. I felt like it was the right time for me. You know, I'm seeing a lot of people in our world, you know, there's kind of a few different ways you can play. You can either be on your own and you can be a consultant and you can kind of do your own thing. You can go within a big giant agency who has an influencer marketing capability and a discipline and a team. You can go brand direct if they have an influencer, you know, team that they want someone in house on the ground running that work. Or you can go over to tech. You can go to a SaaS platform that specializes in influence, a SaaS platform with managed service if you want to actually do the strategy and the execution as well. So there's a lot of different avenues that you can pursue, you know, with an influencer marketing. I've been at them all, you know, and they all have their benefits. They all have their challenges, as you can imagine. But like, I'll say this much, there's never a right time. There's never that time in your career where you're like, oh, this is the perfect opening for me to do this because the economy changes, our industry changes, social media platforms change, influencers are the most trusted you know, comms channel and then something happens and everyone retracts and they start doing their budgeting differently. And it's like, oh, I'm not going to plan full year. I'm going to make it more agile or more opportunistic. And how is that going to impact agency budgets or my own work or all those different things? So I think that, you know, if you understand the landscape and you know what's happening in the world, think about that side by side with yourself, like with what you want to do and what fulfills you and where you want to play. Do you want to be in a big agency, you know, one of many? Do you want to be at a smaller midsize where you might be able to wear more hats and you might be able to, yes, drive the strategy and the execution and have the relationships with the creators and do the contracting and all that stuff? 
Or do you want to be higher level? Do you want to get into the technology of it all so that you can really connect with the platforms and understand their API and all the different things that they're coming out with and how to use that for the benefit of the client? There's so many different ways you can play, understand each of the options, and then pick the one that I think, you know, is most exciting to you. We spend a lot of our time working. If you look at how much time you actually work, you know, versus how much time we don't, whoever thought of the five-day work week, like, no, we could go back in time and rejig the week. But think about it. You know, we spend a lot of time doing this and a lot of years. So make sure it's something that you love. You know, you can taste test. You can go to a buffet and you can try them all out. But I tell my students, you know, in your 30s, taste test in your 20s. It's like dating, right? But in your 30s, you know, think about getting married. Pick which path you really like. Settle down and dig in and then grow that. You know, it's like a relationship. Oh my God, I co-sign that so much. Like that is what your 20s are for. Like my cousin like recently just graduated from college and she has a degree in marketing. And so she's asking advice and I'm just like, try all the different things because you just don't know. I mean, I'm sure you have your own opinions about this, but I personally feel so strongly that like academia can feel like such a bubble and it's like its own thing. And oh God, like I wish I can go back to school as an adult. I feel like it would be such a different experience. Same. Like some of the classes that I took back then, I went to McGill University of Montreal, which is like super, super academic. But some of the classes that I took because I studied cultural studies, I wish I could go back so bad. And like I, you know, I'm in a unique position that I do get to go to school because I'm a professor, you know, so I get to have that experience too. But from the flip side, and I can tell you this much, you know, the adjunct professor, which is what I am because I work in my practice alongside teaching it, the students are obsessed with the adjunct because they're not learning out of a textbook. You know, I remember the first year I taught at DePaul, they were like, okay, what's the textbook we need to order for the bookstore? I'm like, there is no textbook in influencer marketing, you know, back in 2018 or whatever year it was. I was like, I'm just going to bring my work. I'm going to bring the slides I create. I'm going to bring the case studies of work that I've done. You know, I'm going to bring real life stuff that I deal with every single day. And that's how I'm going to teach you. So that when you walk out of my class, you can put together an influencer strategy. And I will say this much, especially my last quarter, some of the influencer strategies that my students put together blew me away. I've hired my students, you know, based on their final. I'm like, oh my God, your final is amazing. Do you need a job? Yeah, come on over. Because it's just phenomenal. Like even when you're going to more of kind of the th theoretical schools and, you know, the kind of, you don't get that hands-on experience, like some of the, you know, more practice schools. But be able to walk out of university and be able to like actually create an influencer strategy where oftentimes people that are already working in agencies don't know that and they need to learn that. Such a skill, such a benefit. So I love school. I wish I could go back. Same, same. But I wish it was, I don't know about you. I mean, I have a degree in theater. So like, but even like, let's say I went out to like be an actress or be a director like I wanted to originally, like. I also feel like I was ill-equipped to actually do it because it was all about the techniques. It was too internal. It wasn't bridging the gap between the technique and like the real world, you know, practice of it all. And it's cool that I, I see more and more, you know, colleges and universities that are implementing, you know, programs where there's specific conversation around influencer marketing, not even just marketing broadly. So it's really cool because that didn't certainly did not exist many years ago at all whatsoever. And I hope that there's more of that educational experience, which is learning from people who are doing it on a regular basis, because it's just like social media and especially influencer work, like it's just changing so rapidly that you need somebody who's like in the thick of it to really speak to it from, you know, that honest current perspective or else, honestly, I feel like it's doing such a disservice otherwise. We can go off on a tangent, but that's just part of my issue personally with academia. I just feel like I want all the students who are spending tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. I just recently paid off my own student debt and I'm 36 years old. I just want to set people up for success as much as humanly possible. And I don't think you do unless 
you have people like yourself who are just like in it on a regular basis that can speak to it from like a very present perspective. Um, but it would be fun to go back as an adult too, <laughs> because I just don't think I appreciated it half as much as I would as an adult. I think it would be so much more fun to like theorize about it and just like test and learn and, you know, in what's a safe environment to do so. Like that's sort of what college should be, at least theoretically. So, you know, you're working in influencer marketing, you're teaching influencer marketing, and you're an educator. What do you like to do for fun? What do you do in your free time? Yeah, all my free time. So like mom life to the max over here. I have three kids. They're under 11. I have two almost six-year-olds and an almost 11-year-old. So I cook, honestly. Like I cook so much because usually like every night I cook about three dinners. I'll cook something for the babies, which I call them the babies, the five-year-old. I'll cook something for Zoe based on what she wants. Sometimes she eats what I cook for my husband and I. So I'm like a cook. I love cooking. You know, I love creating. My mom is an amazing cook. So I, you know, spent a lot of time in the kitchen with her growing up. So I love cooking. I love creating. I'm also a crazy reader. And this is like whenever I tell people how many books I read, they're like, when the heck do you have time to read that many books? Like already this year, I probably read over 45 different books. I love reading. It's, you know, my strategist brain. I move so fast. I talk a lot, clearly. You know, I'm always out doing things, socializing, connecting. Reading is the only thing that gets me to stop. It gets me out of my own life. It gets me out of my own head. It stops the, you know, overthinking. I'm a Virgo. So I read a ton. Like I never don't have a book that's in the go. I just read. I love all types of jars of books. So I pick up anything, you know, that I can get my hands on. And it honestly, it's like meditation to me. It stops me, stops me in my tracks. If ever I'm feeling anxious or I'm feeling uncertain or upset or whatever it is, I just pick up a book and I dive into someone else's life. You know, it might be a little bit of escapism, right? Like I'm going to dive into someone else's life so I don't have to think about my own, but you know, there are worse habits that you could have as escapism. So I'm going to take my reading. Those are the kind of things that I do. But really, you know, it sounds so bizarre, but, you know, I've been in working in this for so long. I've seen it evolve, you know, so much in like over two decades now that teaching, it's one of my passions, you know, I do it because I love it. So it's something that I do for fun. I hardly call it, you know, a second job, even though it kind of is, but it's something that I just love. I love, you know, mentoring, connecting with students, anyone who has any questions about this stuff. I'm like, go grab a coffee. Let's talk about it. So I love that. Those are kind of the things that I do for fun. I love shopping, unfortunately. Um, I'm not very good at it because I don't really go out as much as I used to, you know, ever since the pandemic. But jewelry is my jam. Talking about jewelry, you know, it's one of my most passionate, you know, kind of accessories, so to speak. But here's the weird thing about jewelry. And my sister makes fun of me. She's like, you know what? You just say that so you can buy more. And I'm like, okay, not true, but maybe true. But I know the story behind why I bought anything. I remember like the time. I remember who I bought it from. I remember what I was feeling or thinking about when I bought things. So I attach a story to every single piece of jewelry that I have. And I love, you know, vintage and antique because they came packed with a story already. And then I got to create my own. So yes, I love jewelry, but I love the story behind it. I like the meaning behind it. And it's a bit of like an emblem, you know, that you can kind of carry with you. You can pass it down through generations if it's that kind of jewel. And so I love that, um, you know, about jewelry. I'm not a very good accessorizer, but the one thing that I, I do make sure is on point. No, I love that so much. And when it comes to kids, like, did you sort of envision yourself having three always? Where, no, <laughs> you always want kids even. Yeah, I always wanted to be a mom, for sure, for sure. I kind of thought I would, you know, land it too. I have a really interesting baby story. I'm an open book. Clearly, you probably gathered that already. But, um, you know, I miscarried twice before my first child. Her name is Zoe. And then I tried to have more babies after she was born. I couldn't. 
I couldn't get pregnant. So then my husband and I went through a giant IVF journey. We did eight rounds of IVF in four years, back to back to back. Midway through our journey, we got donor eggs because they said my eggs weren't good. And that could have been the problem why I wasn't getting pregnant. So we got donor eggs. We made embryos. I transferred a stack of them in me. I miscarried every time. And then finally, at the end of that, you know, I was like, okay, maybe my body is just like, no. So we then explored using a gestational surrogate to hold all the the donor egg plus embryos that we had made. We matched with the most magical surrogate who was in Canada. We shipped her our embryos. She transferred one. And then three weeks later, I found out I was pregnant. So during 2017, I managed our surrogate's pregnancy, international pregnancy. I managed my own pregnancy. My sister also got engaged that year. So I was the maid of honor planning engagement parties, bridal showers, you know, bachelorette parties, and then her wedding. And we had two babies in 23 days. So that is the story of my almost twins. They're not twins, even though they're both five. Uh, They were born 23 days apart. So that's, you know, the story of my kids, you know, Mimi, who's the little one I carried, you know, our surrogate carried Leo. All my kids are magical. And, you know, I love this story because clear I'm a storyteller, but that story gives people hope. So many women and families and, you know, they're having babies later, right? Later than my parents' generation, for sure. You know, who are having babies in their early 20s. Like, you can't even imagine being a mom in my early 20s. Like, I was still a wild child then doing all sorts of terrible things. You know, a lot of people are waiting until later. And that's why we're having such a, you know, infertility kind of crisis, if you will, because, you know, our eggs are getting older and it just becomes harder the older that you get. So I love telling that story because there's so many different ways that you can build a family that you can be a parent, that you can be a mom or a dad. So I hope, you know, anyone listening to this who's, you know, going through it, there's definitely a path for you. It might not be smooth and linear, but, you know, any path, you know, is magic. Magic can happen. Totally. I can speak personally. It's like very inspirational to hear your story. And I do hope that It gives those of us who are not spring chickens anymore, but would love to have kids like it gives us hope for sure. It's a hard journey to go through. I mean, like that many rounds of IVF and like what it does, not only on your body, but the mental toll that it takes and then to, you know, miscarry that many times. So to have that much hope and then to have it you know, deflated. I mean, I can only imagine what that feels like, but I don't know. It's like one of those things in life where like it only takes one time to have the child. One good egg, all it takes. One time when it takes and, but it's hard, man. Like it's so hard. And I appreciate you sharing your story so, so much. I wish so many more women would and would just be more open about it. Cause I feel like that's, half the struggle is just feeling like nobody else understands or like, what advice do I take? What steps do I take? I appreciate you telling your story. And I really hope that it inspires other people even to just tell their their story about what they're going through, successful or not. It's so important. Honestly, the first time I ever miscarried, I didn't think I knew anyone who had miscarried. I was embarrassed. I felt like something was wrong with me. I kept it really private, you know, because I was so excited about being pregnant and then it was gone. I literally felt like I was alone on an island. Um, And then, you know, I opened up. I started talking about it after my fifth miscarriage. You know, I was an open book with all my, you know, journey. And it's a community of people that are going through this, you know, and we can be helpful. We can be inspiring. We can just be a shoulder to cry on or just to chat through or listen. You know, sometimes people don't want advice and they don't want your opinion. They just want you to be able to listen and understand. So, you know, anyone who's listening to this wants to talk to me about influencer marketing, I'm absolutely game. But if you also want to just talk about life, I'm here. I love sharing. I love making sure that people don't feel as alone as I did after miscarriage number one. I know that there are so many people listening that 
appreciate that so much, myself included. So thank you for that. So when inevitably people who are listening today want to get in touch, whether it's to talk about influencer marketing, learn how to be a professor, like and what that's like, or talk about motherhood, or just they want to work with you, what's the best way for our audience to get in touch with you? Sure. Well, I have a website. So I've made my name. So this is like early influence, right? Where people have really fancy names and they're kitschy and cute. I didn't do that because <laughs> I started at the beginning of it all when, you know, there were bloggers and it was just your name. So I'm really findable. Just search for me, Jenny Heinrich, and you'll find me. You know, my website's JennyHeinrich.com. I'm Jenny Heinrich on LinkedIn. I'm Jenny Heinrich on Instagram. Be prepared on my, you know, Instagram. It's heavy mom life. So unless you don't want to see like all my kids, don't go there. Go to my LinkedIn instead. But I'm pretty findable. So find me, reach out. You know, I love meeting other people and chatting with other people in our industry. You know, even kind of sub industry like digital marketing, social media marketing. Like I started there, right? I'm a digital strategist. I just happened to flex, you know, into really kind of the creator space in very early days. You know, I mentioned Jesse to you before, you know, last year I was named one of the 30 pioneers in influencer marketing. And I was like, pioneer. I'm like, oh my God, like I'm not 25. Like what? I'm not 25. But the word pioneer threw me. But you know, I've been around forever. I've seen how this industry has changed. If you want to talk to me about that, I'm game. Um, you know, I have a lot of different things that I talk about on my website to the things that I've done and things I'm doing now. Or if you just want to connect and be my friend, I love making friends. So that's probably the best way to reach out. Go to my website or go to LinkedIn. You'll find all the info we need perfection. And we will link all of that in the show notes to make it easier. Pick your poison wherever you enjoy the most. She's there and easy to find. So Jenny, thank you. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you. I'm so happy that you took me up on coming onto the show. And for those of you guys listening, we will see you next week. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, we got to have you back. Check out our website for more ways to get involved, including all the information you need about joining our collective. You can check out all the information at IamWim.com. Leave us a review, a rating, but the most important thing that we can ask you to do is to share this podcast. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week. Tune in next week.